Shab. I am uh, one of uh, the two uh, creators of Lilyhammer. My kind of people too. People who smile at you and me. We got the development deal about three years ago. Um, but before that, we've had we'd had this idea for for many years. But we always thought, you know, the, the idea of a mob guy who goes into witness protection in Norway because he watched the Lillehammer Olympics. We always thought well, that's a really funny idea. But we saw it as an idea for a crime novel or maybe a movie. We didn't quite see that this could be a TV series. What changed that was watching, you know, the, the new types of shows from the States, uh, the, um, the high concept main character driven series like The Hung, where the physical education teacher goes bankrupt and starts working as a gigolo and uh, Breaking Bad, of course, and Weeds and all of these, these uh, shows. And we realized that, wow, this could be turned into, into a series. And then we approached the NRK, um, who were very interested, and, um, and they uh, gave us a development deal. And uh, we always thought that, you know, it's going to be very important who plays the lead. Uh, so when we were writing the first script, we, we, we read in the paper that Steven Van Zandt was coming to Norway to play a concert with uh, Bruce Springsteen. And um, through some uh, uh, connection in the music industry, we were able to set up a meeting in Bergen. Uh, what complicated it a little bit was that at this time we had a baby who was five weeks old <laughs> and we had to bring him to Bergen. So when we showed up at the hotel, the, the girl who had set up the meeting was, uh, she was going, please, please don't mess this up. You're going to make me look so bad. And um, we had a babysitter, but the baby started crying and we ended up all going to the meeting. Um, so it was a really strange experience, but, uh, but uh, we managed to pitch the idea and Stephen immediately liked it and he sort of connected with the idea of this mob guy who comes from, you know, he has a social Darwinistic attitude to his surroundings. He's used to taking what he wants when he wants it and suddenly finds himself stuck in the security net of the social democratic welfare state as an immigrant. And he could, you know, he connected to that idea. Not too much, much jobs, but pizza delivery, man. You know, I had a very successful bar in New York. To start a bar is a, is a, is a very complicated bureaucratic process. Take care of whoever you're going to take care of. New beginnings. New beginnings. First of all, it was just such a big shock that it was going to be shown somewhere else. <laughs> that it doesn't happen that often to Norwegian drama, so so um, so that was a big shock. Netflix came in quite late in the production, so they didn't really have the opportunity to influence the story or the storytelling, but uh, they were uh, uh, very involved in the choice of music and the, the scoring of the, of the show. And I was really impressed that they um, had uh, no problem with uh, subtitles. That's sort of, uh, I had this prejudice that Americans probably can never watch a show with subtitles, but I guess being on so many territories already, they don't have the subtitle phobia that I expected them to have which was very, very good. The first time we sent them the scored episodes, uh, they felt that it was a bit too repetitive for their um, uh, model. So we, we, uh, we changed that and uh, bought songs and Stephen made some great music and you know, it worked out. The mafia and the crime element really appeal to young people, um, but uh, for us, the designing principle in the series was that Frank Tagliano, the mafia guy, he comes to Norway um, and he faces the same challenges and problems that any immigrant does. So it, it's kind of, you know, his main antagonist throughout the series is 
Nor the Norwegian welfare state with all its rules and regulations, and that that brought us, you know, into making a lot of situations that uh, also older viewers really connected to emotionally. They they've been in the the, the queue in the employment office, and they've been waiting in the hospital, and they've been, you know, in that situation, and and they really identified with his frustrations. What? We envy the Americans is the, that their market is, market is uh, so diversified that you don't need to uh, to appeal to so many viewers. You can have shows, great shows like, you know, I like the same as everyone else, Breaking Bad, Mad Men, all those shows that are so satisfying to those who like them, and they don't have to appeal to so many people. Um, that is you know, something that I guess every writer in Europe <laughs> envies those people because uh, in the Norwegian market you need to have a 30% share or more to be successful if you do a drama series. I think um, we all have the feeling that the American model with a showrunner and a writer's room is, um, you know, working very well in the, in the States, but uh, it's um, impossible to implement as it, exactly as it is in the European market. So listening to their experiences and uh, thinking, you know, how, okay, what, how could this possibly be done mm, in my own country? We'll probably be seeing more co-productions like, you know, the, the wonderful Swedish, Danish, uh, the bridge. I think the NRK was also involved, but it's mainly uh, Danish and Swedish, um, which is um, you know a brilliant series. And of course, it's great to sort of combine um, combine forces like that. Uh, I think uh, our project is a, is a, an example that you can have international co-productions grow out of one single original idea that people like and then grow into something bigger it doesn't always have to be a big design and you know some executives saying we want to do a co-production so I, i'm hoping to see more more projects like the, like that